As heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The man wired the woman's bones together using coat hangers and fitted her face with glass eyes. As her skin began to decompose, he replaced it with silk cloth that had been soaked in wax and plaster. When her hair fell out, he fashioned a wig using her real hair, which he was able to obtain after her funeral. He filled her dead and decaying body with rags in order to try and keep her original form, and he dressed his corpse girlfriend in her own clothing, stockings, jewelry, and gloves. He also used copious amounts of perfume, disinfectants, and preserving agents to mask the odor and slow the decomposition of the body. He had to, because he kept her body in his own bed. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Key West has always been home to some of America's great eccentrics. It's a place that, far removed from the mainland of America, serves as sort of the last outpost for writers, dreamers, musicians, and weirdos. I consider it one of the greatest places on Earth, if that tells you anything. But in 1940, news spread around the island that something very strange was taking place in Dr. Von Kossel's local laboratory, and when details were revealed about what it was, we finally discovered just what was too much, even for weirdo Key West folks to handle. July 31, 1909 marks the birth date of Maria Elena Milagro de Hoyos, the daughter of a Key West cigar maker named Francisco Pancho Hoyos and his wife Aurora. Maria Elena had a bit of a tragic life. She had a sister who died from tuberculosis and a brother-in-law who was electrocuted on a construction site. Soon after she was married, she miscarried and her husband abandoned her and moved to Miami. To make matters worse, Maria Elena also contracted tuberculosis, a typically fatal disease at the time. She sought treatment at the United States Marine Hospital in Key West, and that is when her story takes a very strange turn. While at the hospital, she met a German-born radiologic technologist named Carl Tanzler, or as he liked to refer to himself, Carl von Kossel. Tanzler actually had many names. He was born Carl Tanzler, or George Carl Tanzler, on February 8, 1877, in Dresden, Germany. 
Little is known about his true background because his invented one was so confusing and changed so often. He grew up in Germany but claimed to have traveled to India and Australia where he did electrical work, bought boats, purchased a South Seas island, and began building a trans-ocean flying plane around the time of World War I. When the war broke out, he alleged that he was jailed by British authorities for safekeeping and was released at war's end. We do know that he emigrated to the United States in 1926 via Cuba. From Cuba, he settled in Zephyr Hills, Florida, where his sister lived. In 1927, he took a job at the U.S. Marine Hospital using the name Carl von Kossel. It was at the hospital that he met Elena Hoyos, and he immediately fell in love with her. He later claimed that as a child he was visited by visions of a dead ancestor, Countess Anna Constantia von Kossel, who revealed to him the face of his true love, an exotic dark-haired woman. He was convinced the vision had been of Elena. Tanzler, with his self-professed medical knowledge, attempted to treat and cure her with a variety of medicines, as well as X-ray and electrical equipment that were brought to Maria's home. He showered her with gifts of jewelry and clothing and professed his love to her. There is nothing to say that Elena ever reciprocated his affections, though. It's likely that she was baffled by the attention being given to her by the strange little man. Despite Tanzler's best efforts, Elena died from tuberculosis at her parents' home October 25, 1931. Tanzler paid for her funeral, and with permission from her family, he then commissioned the construction of an above-ground mausoleum in the Key West Cemetery, which he visited almost every night. No one knows what finally pushed Tanzler over the edge, but it's believed that he heard Elena calling to him from her grave, asking him to free her from her stone prison. He later stated that Elena's spirit appeared to him when he sat next to her tomb and serenaded her with her favorite song. So, one night, in April 1933, Tanzler crept into the cemetery and removed Elena's body from the mausoleum, carting it out of the graveyard in a toy wagon. He took her home with him, and that is when things got even stranger. Tanzler wired Elena's bones together with wire and coat hangers. He fitted her face with glass eyes. As her skin began to decompose, he replaced it with silk cloth that had been soaked in wax and plaster. When her hair fell out, he fashioned a wig from hair that had been given to him by Elena's mother soon after her funeral in 1931. He filled her cadaver with rags so that she could keep her original form, and he dressed Elena in her own clothing, stockings, jewelry, and gloves. Tanzler also used copious amounts of perfume disinfectants, and preserving agents to mask the odor and slow the decomposition of the body. He had to do so, because he kept Elena's body in his own bed. In October 1940, Elena's sister, Florinda, heard rumors of Tanzler sleeping with the disinterred body of her sister and confronted Tanzler at his home, where Elena's body was discovered. Tanzler was arrested and detained for desecrating Elena's tomb. Stealing her corpse was not illegal at the time. Tanzler was examined by psychiatrists, but they found him mentally competent to stand trial. After a preliminary hearing, though, the charges had to be dismissed. The statute of limitations for the crime had expired. The case drew the attention of South Florida newspapers, and it created a sensation among the public both regionally and across the country. Believe it or not, the public mood towards Tanzler was generally sympathetic. Many viewed the eccentric German as romantic. There was no conclusive evidence at the time that Carl had sexual relations with Elena's corpse, but later examinations suggested that it was possible. During the furor over the story, Elena's body was examined by pathologists and then put on public display at the Dean Lopez Funeral Home in Key West. 
where it was seen by nearly 7,000 people. Elena's corpse was eventually returned to the Key West Cemetery and was reburied in an unmarked grave in a secret location to prevent any further tampering. In the aftermath of the discovery, Tanzler left Key West, but he didn't do so in shame. He returned to Zephyr Hills, Florida, and wrote an autobiography that appeared in the pulp magazine Fantastic Adventures in 1947. He became a U.S. citizen in Tampa in 1950. He never got over his obsession with Elena Hoyos. Still longing for his lost love, he created a death mask of her as the basis for a life-sized dummy, which he kept in his bed until his death on July 3, 1952. Some accounts of Tandler's death claim his body was actually found in the arms of the dummy, but this is merely wishful thinking by those of morbid sensibilities. According to his obituary, he died on the floor of his home. It was noted, though, that overlooking his corpse was a waxen image wrapped in silken cloth and a robe. It seems that his replacement, Elena, was with him to the very end. One murdered pair of lovers and one supposedly murdering pair of servants dominated Canadian headlines in 1843 and continues to fascinate countless people today. But did Grace Marks and James McDermott actually murder Thomas Kinnear and Nancy Montgomery? The truth about who actually committed this gruesome killing, recently at the heart of Netflix's Alias Grace series, may never be known for sure. One summer day in July 1843, a gruesome discovery was made in what is now Ontario, Canada. The bodies of Thomas Kinnear and his housekeeper, Nancy Montgomery, were found at his home. The pair, who also happened to be lovers, had been brutally murdered, with Kinnear shot and Montgomery struck on the head and then strangled. It didn't take long for the police to track down the two likeliest suspects, 20-year-old James McDermott and 16-year-old Grace Marks, both Irish-born servants in the Kinnear household who had vanished in the wake of the crimes, taking a bundle of stolen goods with them. Both the brutality of the crime and its undercurrent of sex turned the trial into a media sensation while the mystery of the crime itself has never been completely solved. The accused themselves remain something of a mystery as well, not much is known about the early lives of either Grace Marks or James McDermott before their trial. What we do know is that Grace Marks was born in Ulster, Ireland, and emigrated to Canada with her family in 1840 when she was 12 years old. McDermott had likewise come to Canada from Ireland in 1837 and previously served in the 1st Provincial Regiment of the Providence of Lower Canada before being hired to work for Kinnear. Marx was hired to work for Kinnear as well about a week after McDermott. Marx claimed everything went on very quietly for a fortnight. Other than that, she witnessed Montgomery scolding the newly hired McDermott for not doing his work properly. McDermott, however, claimed that Marx and the housekeeper used to quarrel, although he also admitted Montgomery had been overbearing to him and that he had complained to Kinnear. I did not like that Nancy should scold me so often, he said. Both McDermott and Marx each claimed that the other had been mistreated by Montgomery and in turn plotted to murder her. Accounts of the trial tend to either cast Grace Marx as the cunning instigator of a brutal crime who overwhelmed McDermott with her wicked wiles or as an unwitting and somewhat dim-witted accomplice who had instead been strong-armed into the murder by the more powerful McDermott. And the defendants themselves seemed only too eager to help paint these exaggerated portraits of each other in order to save their own skins. That said, McDermott did not deny his participation in the murder, but did claim that I should not have done it if I had not been urged to do so by Grace Marks, who had called him a coward and threatened he should never have an hour's luck if he did not assist her. 
According to Marx, however, McDermott explained his plan to kill both Kinnear and Montgomery and make off with their valuables before making her promise to assist him. The next afternoon, she claimed that she saw McDermott dragging Nancy along the yard while she was pumping water outside. When she returned to the kitchen, McDermott asked her for a handkerchief because Montgomery was not yet dead before going down into the cellar to finish the job. When he re-emerged after strangling the housekeeper, he told Marx that her life was not worth a straw if she told anyone. Although Marx had clearly hoped her confession would pin the blame on McDermott, it does contain some bizarre comments that call into question how much of a supposedly unwilling accomplice she was. For example, she admitted that she yelled at McDermott to take Montgomery outside rather than bludgeon her in the house, shouting, for God's sake, don't kill her in the room, you'll make the floor all bloody. Additionally, after the murders, Marx also admitted to helping McDermott pack up all the valuable things we could find before the pair fled and were eventually apprehended in the first place. However, in his version of the story, McDermott claimed that Marx was the means of the murder from beginning to end, and even added in the gruesome detail that the maid had descended to the cellar several times in order to strip Montgomery's body of valuables, and that only his own persuasion kept her from ripping the earrings off the corpse. Despite their finger-pointing, both Grace Marks and James McDermott did confess to complicity in the murders. McDermott was shown no mercy and hanged, but perhaps because of her youth or her gender, the court took pity on Grace Marks and sentenced her to life imprisonment rather than death. She wound up serving a total of 29 years in prison before being granted a pardon in 1872. After her release, she crossed the border into New York and seemingly vanished from history, taking the truth about what had happened that day in July 1843 with her. With the truth about the case still unclear, Grace Marks remains a fascinating enigma to this day. This is partly due to the popularity of Margaret Atwood's fictionalized retelling of the murders, alias Grace, published in 1996. This award-winning take on the crime and its aftermath was then turned into a popular Netflix series, also called Alias Grace, in 2017. But as for what really happened to Thomas Kinnear and Nancy Montgomery, the full story went to the grave with James McDermott and Grace Marks. For the past few months, I've had weird little things happen at night. I would be laying in bed, and slowly but surely I would start feeling a weight press onto my back and down onto the mattress, and then a pressure draped around my side. I'm a side sleeper. I would throw the blankets off of me as I would suddenly start feeling really hot. I made sure it hadn't just been a pillow that slid down behind me, and surely enough that was never the case. I would hear what sounded like a man breathing right behind my neck after holding my breath for a little bit because I felt the bed rising and falling slightly out of sync with my slower breathing. A lot of the time, it sounded kind of labored, like they were having a hard time breathing. This would go on for a while until I felt like I needed to switch positions, so sometimes I'd roll over onto my other side. The presence would go away for a second, and then come back behind me again. Other times I would be frustrated and move to the other end of the bed, then it would usually leave. I would feel very comfortable and loved during a majority of these times, but I'm an easily frustrated person and other times I would grow irritated because I'm not that fond of being touched. This next bit is relevant to the story. Instead of heaters or central air, we have a big wood-burning stove in our kitchen that we use during the winter to keep the house warm. I always sleep with my door closed except for the winter when I want heat in, so I'll leave the door cracked open maybe two-thirds of the way. I've never sleepwalked my entire life, so any time that I've gotten up in the middle of the night 
to do miscellaneous things like use the restroom down the hall or go to the kitchen for something, I've always been awake. Anyway, I would sleep soundly through the night, and when I would wake up, the door would be completely shut for no reason. I incessantly asked my family who had done it and accused my siblings of closing my door at night. It was quite annoying because my room would be absolutely freezing when I woke up. My family swore that no one did it because why would they anyway? All of us kept our doors open for heat, so it didn't make sense for them to close only mine for whatever reason. This went on for a little longer, then stopped once it got a little warmer and we didn't have to use the furnace anymore, and I slept with my door closed again. A lot of the times I get hot but don't want to turn on my air conditioner, so instead I just take off my shirt and sleep without it with the fan blowing on me. I would feel out of nowhere like someone was running their finger down my back, my neck, or my cheek. Sometimes it would be light little touches all over me, but especially my back, hip, and face. Now, the room didn't feel particularly cold or negative, and I didn't feel unsafe, but I definitely felt like there was someone in the room with me. Usually, after these occasions where I'd feel the touches, I wouldn't wake up with any marks, but one night last month I kept feeling it touch this one part of my back over and over again. It was next to my right shoulder blade and a couple of inches below. When I was getting dressed that morning, I saw four three or so centimeter long scratches in the same area I was feeling it touch me. They went away sometime throughout the morning. They weren't deep but right on the surface and thin but not thin enough to be that of a cat or a dog. I don't sleep with my pets in my room anyway. A lot of those nights, I would then have dreams of being with someone that I've never met before, pretty much always with black hair, strange eye colors like red, bright green, bright pink, yellow, but mostly with the same general features. We would interact with each other in the dreams as I normally would with someone I'm friends with or someone I love. He's very tall in these dreams, maybe around six and a half feet or so. I've also heard whispering or soft male voices speaking at night, but that's pretty rare. I woke up at 1.30 in the morning a few months ago and heard two hushed voices of men conversing. It stopped as soon as I shot up from my bed being alert. I couldn't make out what they were saying as it was too quiet. To finish this off, I've only seen one of those things once. The other time, my sister saw it. The layout of our house is like you walk down from the hallway where my room is at, and at the end you take a left and there's the kitchen. Right is to the lounge and the entryway. I'd come back to tell my sister something who was sitting near the very back of the kitchen at the table. From there, you can see down most of the hallway. She said that as I was walking back down the hall towards the kitchen, she saw a slightly translucent black silhouette of a man run after me from out of my room, then disappear around the corner towards the entryway where you can't see in. The other time I was yet again walking down the hallway when I saw a large, stocky, opaque shadow leaning out from behind the trim of the bedroom at the very end of the hall. It quickly vanished when I looked at it. Coming up, legend has it a ghost told the building's architect to take the job. We'll look at the creepy history behind the construction of the Bradbury Building in downtown Los Angeles. Plus, You expect strange on-the-job tales from those who work in or near graveyards or those who are close to the dead, such as mortuaries, even hospitals. But the brave men and women in law enforcement, they have a few stories of their own to tell. That's up next.
while you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. We rely on the brave men and women in blue to keep our streets and neighborhoods as safe as possible. Facing dangers day in, day out in the form of domestic assaults, robberies, drug abuse, drunk driving, violent crime, and even murder. But there is another area of danger that the police face and we tend not to think about it – the area of the paranormal. Here are just a few stories of cops brave enough to tell their tales. I related this before, but I, as part of my reserve training, I had to pull a 12-hour shift in corrections. Our county facility is old, old, old. Anyway, it was med call, so the nurse had opened the little clinic and we went to each cell block and had inmates line up to get their meds. After that was finished, the nurse left the clinic was closed, and all the inmates were back in their blocks. I secured the last block, and as I turned back toward the clinic, I saw the shadow on the floor of someone crossing back to the clinic. I dashed around the corner, thinking an inmate had managed to avoid being secured and was sneaking into the clinic. There was no one there. The shadow had been absolutely distinct. One of the other COs laughed and said, oh, that's just Miss Rose. She's been hanging around here for years shudder. It creeped me out pretty good. Myself and a buddy on my squad responded to an alarm. The incident location was an old office-type building that had been converted to doctor's offices. There was a pharmacy attached to it. Our dispatch received a motion signal from an upstairs office. Keyholder arrives on scene and we go in to secure the building. The stairs were locked behind a door that, of course, the keyholder didn't have keys to, so we took the elevator up to the second floor. Not the most tactically sound option, I know. The elevator opens to a pitch black hallway, except for one overhead light at the end of the hall. We start checking doors, and so far, all are secured. We get to the last office, and sure enough, the door is unlocked. We make entry and observe it to be an unused office. The door opened to a sizable waiting room and reception area. There were about 10 or 12 exam rooms all cleared with no hiccups. We exit the office and immediately something seems off. That's when I realized the overhead light at our end of the hallway that had been on was now off, replaced by another light over by the elevators. I look at my squad mate and he's completely white. I ask him what's wrong and he says, weren't all those doors we just checked closed and locked? I tell him, yeah, so? But he says, well, now they're all standing open. Sure enough, all the offices down the hallway we had just checked were now standing open. Pucker factor sinks in at this point. So we start clearing offices and securing offices. We finish the last office and on our way out, just before we turn the corner to get into the waiting area, the main door just slams shut, and then our radios start going nuts with some kind of static feedback. Now I just want to get the hell out of there. We get back in the elevator and head down to the first floor to make contact with the keyholder again. However, keyholder is nowhere to be found. I contact dispatch and request a callback number for the keyholder so I could advise him of what we found. Dispatch states that the keyholder was still en route to us and was advising an ETA of five minutes. I advised dispatch that we'd already been out with the keyholder. Dispatch requests I give them a call. I call dispatch and she tells me that there's no way we were out with a keyholder. 
She states that the alarm company had only just made contact with one. Eventually, the real keyholder arrives on scene, and I ask her about the man that had let us in the building, the first keyholder that we met. She asked me to describe him, so I did. She states that it sounds like one of the doctors that used to lease the office on the second floor at the end of the hall. She then states that he committed suicide at his summer home several days ago. I still won't go back there. When I was a municipal cop, I was sent to a missing person slash runaway juvenile call. The town I work in was inner city and poor, but it was one of the better streets in town and the family was squared away. The husband and wife were both educators. While I was taking the report of their runaway teenage daughter in the family's living room, an older daughter who was in the room pointed toward a hallway and yelled, Grandma! The husband ran into the hallway yelling, Ma! Ma! The husband returned to the living room and asked, Officer, did you see her? Did you see my mother? I told him I had not and asked him why it was remarkable that his mother had walked down the hallway. The husband replied, She died last year. We see her walking around the house all the time. I took the rest of the report while standing on the front porch. A few years back, prior to being a sworn law enforcement officer, I worked as a security guard at a hospital. Sounds cool, and it was, except for the fact it was 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. I worked alone, and the hospital I guarded was abandoned. I was always a third-shift kind of person. I don't get night jitters or scare easily, but this place could do it to the best of them. Every night, I would walk or ride a wheelchair through the halls that were supposed to be empty and unused. Every night, I would end up having to close doors and relock them. I'd walk one floor, move up to the next, and continue on. It got a little shaky when an hour after already walking a hallway, I'd have to turn off the same hall lights and close the same doors again in the building. Or when I'd be walking a hall and I'd hear footsteps on the floor above me, doors opening and closing, elevators moving from floor to floor phones ringing, nurse call lights going on, etc. There were only three times I got a I hate this crap feeling. First time I was checking offices on the fourth floor. There was a light on in the locked hallway, no surprise. This hallway hadn't been renovated since the place was built, short of electricity, so everything was from the 1920s. Unlock the door, flip the lights, walk out, relock the door, and turn to leave. Behind me, I hear the flip of a light switch. Through the frosted glass, I see the lights went back on. I left the hallway alone that night. Second time was riding an elevator between floors. I was taking the elevator to the top floor when, at about number four or number five floor, I heard laughing or muffled talking. It kept getting louder as I got higher. Elevator makes it to number five, doors swing open, and absolute silence. Of course, every light on the floor was on, even in the patient rooms. I checked high and low. Not a single living and breathing person in that place, except for me. Third, and worst of all, was just an average night. I'm on the lower level, locking a door in a corridor. The door had a glass middle, but on the back side it was covered by white tape. The room it led to was dark, and the hallway a few feet behind me was partially lit, so the glass acted like a perfect mirror. Everything normal, key in, lock clicks, turning the key, when behind me I see the full outline of a person walk past me in the hallway. Clear as day, just a full shadow of a person walked past. I froze only for about a second and then ran into the hall after the supposed person. No one just silence. I was sitting in the flat of a hill monitoring traffic. It was about 2 to 3 a.m. Where I was sitting, it's a well-known spot where an unsolved murder victim was found about 26 years ago. No other officers would sit here, even though citizens are constantly doing 15 to 20 miles per hour over the limit in this area. As I was sitting there, 
I saw a shadow cross the back of my unit coming from the passenger side. Almost immediately afterwards, the shadow came up the driver's side of my unit, then across the front. Mind you, it is completely dark in this area, and the only lighting around me is from the moon. Thinking the worst, I turn on all my lights to light up the area to see if I can see who or what is around me. Nothing. I figured it was time to leave that area. Once I got to a lighted area, I stopped and realized that my camera was recording from where I hit my emergency lights. I reviewed the footage, and you can see where a figure starts from the driver front of my unit, then for half a second the entire camera goes black as if someone put their finger over the lens. Then it goes back to normal. Needless to say, I haven't sat back in that spot. I used to work for a private police security firm as a patrol supervisor. On one of my patrol routes, we had a huge church that was also a private daycare and kindergarten. It was my responsibility to clear and secure the building every night between 3 and 4 a.m. due to recent instances of doors being found left open in the morning. In the early 1900s, the building was a schoolhouse and supposedly a fire killed several children trapped inside. I didn't know any of this prior to working for the company. Several extremely creepy things happened while at the church. My first night there, I had just walked down the very long main classroom hallway to clear all of the rooms, and when I turned around to walk back up the hallway, there was a red balloon floating in the middle of the hall that was definitely not there prior. In the old pastor's office, There was a lamp shaped like a lighthouse that sat on a table in a large window. When I would pull up to the church, the lamp would be the first thing I'd see in the office window. It was always turned on. However, when I would go to check and lock the pastor's office from the inside, the lamp would always be off. When I would get back into the car to leave, the light would be back on again. I also had the unusual phenomena of previously closed and locked doors being found open just seconds after closing and locking them. Another officer that filled in for me one evening quit the very next day because he reported that as he was checking the main chapel, the pipe organ started playing itself. My FTO told me about this one school on Oahu that has a statue. Two officers were sent there because the alarm was going off and both walked past this statue that's outside on campus. The officers didn't find anyone inside the school, and after the case was done, the two officers asked each other if they had seen the statue's head turning to look at them. Apparently, they had seen it move. That same school is also notorious for having false alarms when the school is closed and no one's inside. The school installed a microphone in the classrooms, and during one call it picked up laughter of children. Only the voices were kind of shimmering or moving in and out. I can't describe it. Sort of like the ghostly effects from movies, I guess. I got sent to that school last week for an alarm going off in a classroom, and again the dispatcher said they could hear juveniles. However, the school was closed, and there wasn't a kid around. The doors and windows were locked, too weird. I was on duty one night at the front desk of our office when I got a call from an elderly male in a village a few miles away. He was very short of breath and wanted me to give him the number of a local doctor. I didn't have the number on hand, so I put the phone down for a couple of seconds while I looked it up. When I picked up the phone again, the line was still open, but I couldn't hear anything. I tried shouting into the phone, telling the man to make any sort of noise if he could hear me, but I got nothing. I contacted the control room on another line and got them to trace the call so that I could help the man who I was convinced had collapsed and was dying. When the number was traced, the local cops went round to the address, which they recognized as the scene of a sudden death three weeks before. The sole occupant of the house had died of a respiratory illness and the house was empty and vacant on their arrival. It would seem that I had a call from beyond the grave. I don't answer the phone anymore. Several years ago, while on duty, another officer and I responded to a possible prowler call. 
When we arrived, we were met by the residents who advised that the light in the living room had turned off and they saw a female walking in the room. We were about to conduct an interior search when a neighbor called us over. The neighbor told us that everyone who rents the house leaves after a couple of months due to strange occurrences. We went back and asked the resident if they were moving out. We saw moving boxes through the window. The resident said they were moving out because they would see a female in the house and lights would turn on and off. Not too scary a story, but definitely different. A traffic guy at my agency was catching up to a DUI suspect. No lights or sirens. The suspect was easily three to four hundred yards ahead at 0330 hours on a very long stretch of semi-rural road. The left side of the street was lit by street lights and the right side was dark. Both cars were moving fast, about 80 miles per hour or so. His dash cam video showed the suspect vehicle lose something from its rear and it turned out it was the suspect's rear bumper. After the bumper stopped tumbling, the video showed a black figure dart into the roadway from the left, the side lit by the street lights, pick up or move the bumper, and then dart to the right side of the roadway where it was dark. The video showed nothing on the right side of the roadway when the officer drove by the area. The officer did not see this occur at the time, but instead when he reviewed his video in the car to find out where the suspect lost his bumper. The dark figure had no reflective clothing on, as most joggers and dog walkers do in the area, and was definitely in the right place at the right time, as the officer most likely would have hit the bumper due to his speed and probably crashed. Prior to law enforcement, I was in college and worked nights as a security officer at the historic Blackstone Hotel in Fort Worth, Texas. The Blackstone was a luxury hotel when it opened the year before the stock market crash and depression, but it went to seed in later years. As part of my job, I had to do floor checks, including stairwells. I usually started at the top and worked my way down using the stairwells in a back-and-forth pattern since they were located at opposite ends of each floor. Each well had fire doors about every five floors. The top floor had a permanently closed restaurant, ballroom, and bar. The top ten floors weren't being leased to anyone at the time. One night, I started my usual check at the top floor and entered the first stairwell. As I entered, I heard footsteps in the well, and the fire door below me slammed shut. I figured one of the local homeless had somehow slipped into the building and camped out, so I rushed to catch up. I was in pretty good shape, but never got closer than two floors to my quarry. The stairwell emptied into an entry foyer from the street that was locked at night, so there was only one way out, which was into the main lobby and past the front desk. I asked the night clerk where the intruder went, as he or she should have passed right by that desk. The clerk hadn't seen anyone. While posted in the lobby after doing checks, I often saw the two main elevators return home to the lobby after taking passengers to their respective floors. On several occasions, I watched the elevators leave the lobby level when no one had entered, go to the top floor, then return to the lobby. When the doors opened, there was no one inside the elevator. My boss at the time was a FWPD officer of about 30 years' service who told me that there were several people who did double gainers with a half twist out the windows when the market crashed. He also said that over the past 15 years, this was around 1975-1980, the hotel probably averaged one suicide a year. When I was working as an EMT and security officer at a casino, I was walking the parking structure around 0300 hours. Up on the hill, by the top level were some street lights, a guardrail, and a road leading up to a water tower, but nothing else. This night, the light seemed to be a lot dimmer than usual, and there was an all-black figure just standing there, looking straight ahead. I couldn't tell if it was looking down the hill at me or up the hill towards the tower. I didn't have a flashlight on me, so I decided to go grab one before investigating. I went down one level, and met up with another officer and told him about the figure. The hill was in sight the entire time. I turned to speak with the officer briefly, 
and when I turned back around, the lights seemed to have been turned up to normal and the figure was gone. I found out later that there had been a number of sightings in the area and on levels 5 through 7 of the garage. Apparently, when the casino was put in, they had to move an old Indian cemetery, and the sightings started soon after that. The timeless, fantastic Bradbury Building at Broadway and 3rd Street in Los Angeles is a much-beloved landmark, most widely known for its significant appearances in movies, including the original Blade Runner, 500 Days of Summer, and Marlowe, starring the late James Garner. But the popular film set also has a lesser-known occult connection. Avery Truffleman, producer of the Design and Architecture podcast 99% Invisible, talked to esoteric operators Kim Cooper and Richard Shave about the eerie history of what 99PI calls arguably the biggest architectural movie star of Los Angeles. The edifice was the idea of a gold-mining magnate who really wanted to put his name on a building. His vision led him to turn down a prominent architect and mysteriously commission a totally untrained one instead, and that not-quite-architect, George H. Wyman, turned to ghosts and literature to pull it off. As the story goes, Lewis Bradbury, a gold-mining millionaire, decided he wanted to build and put his name on a building. So in 1892, he commissioned prominent architect Sumner P. Hunt, who alone and with partners would design the Southwest Museum, the Ebel Club, the Automobile Club at University Park, and loads of private homes for wealthy clients throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Hunt prepared some plans for the proposed building, but when Bradbury visited the office to check them out, none of the designs impressed him. And here's where things got weird. As Bradbury was leaving the office, he noticed Hunt's draftsman, a young man named George H. Wyman. Wyman had zero training or experience as an architect at this point, but Bradbury, for reasons still not really known to anyone, walked up to Wyman and offered him the chance to design a large, high-profile, half-million-dollar office building. Wyman was initially and justifiably weirded out by the request. He was totally unqualified for the job, and in taking the commission, he would essentially be stealing a client from his boss. Unsure of how to proceed, Wyman decided to consult someone wiser – his dead brother. To do this, Wyman employed a planchette, which looks exactly like the instrument that everyone puts their hands on to navigate a Ouija board. This planchette has a pencil attached, and so instead of indicating letters one by one, it writes out whole words and sentences. At the time, spiritualism was very much in fashion, says Esoterics Cooper, and planchettes would typically be consulted when someone had an issue that they wanted some guidance on. In Wyman's case, he and his wife sat down together, put their hands on the planchette, and asked Wyman's dead brother whether to take the job. In a very childish script hand, Cooper says, the mystical device wrote out the phrase, Take Bradbury, you will be. And after that, there was a word that at first appeared to be gibberish, but when read upside down, it supposedly said, successful. Take Bradbury and you will be successful. Okay. The dead brother came through and the job was a go. And Wyman was successful. The Bradbury was such an invigorating project that he eventually went to school and became an actual architect. As for Wyman's first big commission, the Bradbury has a kind of timeless versatility that has led it to play a diverse set of locations – a Burmese hotel, a seedy office building, a futuristic ruin. It is said that Wyman's inspiration for the building's design was directly inspired by a novel Looking Backwards by Edward Bellamy, a popular science fiction novel about a utopian society that was published in 1888. A passage from that book describes this incredible building in the future, which in those days was the year 2000. A vast hall full of light received not alone from the windows on all sides, but from the dome. (laughs) 
Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. The sound of a phone ringing woke me up. At first, I couldn't determine where the sound came from, and I really freaked out because my room was directly above my mother's room, and living in an old house I always tried to be as quiet as possible. I sprinted up from bed and located the sound as coming from one of my drawers full of old stuff that I didn't really use. I always used to collect old stuff, never cleaning anything out. I started digging in one of the drawers and I finally found the cause of my panic. It was one of my old phones. It wasn't ringing, it had an alarm that was going off. This was a phone I hadn't used in a good few years, so I was really confused at this point. It was an old Samsung. At the time, I just turned the alarm off and went back to bed, even though I had problems falling back to sleep after that. The next day, I got up. And checked the phone again, and I realized it didn't even have a battery in it. My name is Sean. I'm a Christian born and raised in southeastern Pennsylvania. There have been a few interesting events in my life that one could say touch on the unexplained or supernatural. Somewhere back around 1996-1997, I had two separate events that shook me pretty good, then a third later in life around 2003. The first took place at work. I was a shipper for a small company. My work area was in the basement of an old building. The building was one of those old three-story industrial brick buildings that you'd have to walk upstairs to get to the first floor. The basement was only three feet below ground level, and that is where I spent eight hours of my day, Monday to Friday. It was a decently lit basement, with the fluorescent lights mounted to the ceiling, but not aligned over the aisles very well. There were shelves that ran perpendicular to the white, painted brick outside walls where we stored finished goods ready to be shipped. I would receive paperwork for orders fill and prep for shipping, fill out all UPS paperwork, and then wait for the UPS guy. One day, I was filling an order and I was in one of these poorly lit aisles. There was a little basement window in the outside wall, but it was behind the shelving rack I was picking from, and the ceiling light was in the main aisle but not shining very well into the one I was working in. Then it happened. As I reached to grab a part box, a shadow came across the wall. I looked around, but I was alone in the basement. Mind you, this isn't a very large basement, and although we had a receiver who worked down there with me, he was out of the building at the time. I looked back at my hand, which was still reaching for the part box, and still there against the wall was the shadow. It was then I realized it wasn't a normal shadow. It was dark, darker than dark. It was the opposite of light, any light. I've been in the back of caves in West Virginia with a youth group, and we would turn off our flashlights to experience the complete and utter darkness. And this shadow was that same darkness, if not darker. It moved across the wall and onto the shelving. It moved fluidly and molded itself to any surface it came in contact with, like water moving over a rock. It enveloped all it came in contact with, and as it did, 
you couldn't define the surface it was on. Dropping the box, I jumped back and moved quickly into the main aisle. Again, I looked for someone in the basement with me, but there was no one. I was all alone with whatever the shadow was. From the main aisle, I could still see it, moving across the wall and shelving. It moved toward the area of the wall that was closer to the window, and as it did, the light on the wall disappeared. Immediately, I started praying to Christ to protect me and in His name command it to leave, and just as quickly as it appeared, it was gone. Light that came through the window onto the wall returned. Mind you, no light was blocked from coming in the window from the outside. It was still daylight outside. Just wherever that thing touched, the light was gone on that surface. I went upstairs to use the phone. This was still pre-cell phone days and called my mom and asked her to pray with me before I went back down into that basement. I returned to my desk and saw nothing more of the shadow. I worked in that basement for months and never saw anything like that again, there or anywhere else. I know what I saw, and I'll never forget it. Something that absorbed light, something that obviously feared the name of God was down there that day. Something. My family moved into a new house in Nagoya, Japan. The first week was all chaos, as we were still unpacking boxes, rearranging furniture, etc. On the first floor, there was a long hallway that led from the front door to the kitchen. One afternoon, as I was walking down the hallway, I felt a sudden urge to turn and look behind me. I was startled to see a tall man in the shape of a featureless black shadow moving down the hallway close behind me. As he moved along the hallway, he seemed to radiate a small aura of darkness around him, casting a shadow in all directions, blotting out the light on the floor, the walls and the ceiling in a murky circle around him as he moved along the passageway. I stepped into a doorway and watched him hurry past me until he disappeared out of sight at the other end of the hallway. I really didn't know what to think about what I had seen, but it wasn't the first time I'd encountered a ghostly presence, and I didn't get any real bad feeling from the Shadow Man, so I chose to ignore it. Maybe I was just too tired from moving and I was seeing things that weren't there. The next day, I was resting on the sofa on the second floor with my wife after a hard day of unpacking. Out of the blue, she turned to me and said, Have you seen the Shadow Man? Then she told me she had seen him walking along the hallway downstairs. I told her that I had seen the same guy in the same place earlier the same day. After discussing it a while, we both decided that neither of us had sensed anything malignant about the Shadow Man, so we just decided to let things be. Two days later, I was climbing up the stairs to the second floor when I met the shadow man coming down the stairs toward me. This time he seemed very aware of my presence as he halted and stood still in front of me. Even though I couldn't make out any features on his face, I could feel a sense of shock and fear coming from him. He turned and fled up the stairs, moving away from me as fast as he could. We've been in the house for three years since then and no one has encountered the Shadow Man again. I'm not sure what it was about me that frightened the Shadow Man, but evidently it was enough to drive him from our house. I'd like to know, have any of you had the experience where you met a ghost and you scared the wits out of him? We moved into my grandma's house when I was around 15 years old. I loved it there. After she died, we started having strange occurrences. One day, while I was home alone, I swore I heard somebody laughing in the basement. I went down there and searched, but could not find anyone. 
I think it was the husband because I was told he used to tinker with stuff in the basement a lot before he died. Another odd thing that would happen was when we would be sitting in the living room watching television. We would always see people walking through the kitchen from the corner of our eyes. I do not know whether it was our eyes playing tricks on us or what. One night I was sleeping in my room and I awoke to the sound of metal banging on metal. I thought that maybe it was the neighbors doing something weird outside, but I looked at my clock and realized it was about 3 a.m. Then I figured out what it was. I had a brass bed with plastic beads hanging on it. There was no draft coming into the room. The vent was not blowing, and I was not moving, but somehow my beads were banging against the bed. After I saw that, I looked around the room and saw a bunch of little lights floating around. I do not know what that was, but it scared the crap out of me. We would hear footsteps, laughter, music, and all kinds of weird stuff would go on. We eventually sold the house and moved, and I have never had any paranormal experience like that since. Thank God. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Dark page at WeirdDarkness.com. This happened several years ago while I was in college. I was staying with some friends who lived in an apartment complex. We stayed up until late, and then we decided to get some sleep. They showed me to my room I went to bed and I was drifting off when I felt someone come into my room. I opened my eyes and was immediately startled as there was a shadow of a woman with long black hair parted down the middle in what seemed like a long flowing gown or robe. I could not see her face, it was shadowed, but I knew it was a woman. She was standing at the foot of my bed on the left side. She reached out with her hand and touched my foot. Then, once she had touched me, she vaporized into a black mist and hovered above my bed, specifically in the corner of the room. I watched as this mist, which looked like a mixture of black smoke and electrical current, just disintegrated. I sat up and tried to comprehend what just happened and why, but just figured it was something I may have to get used to and to be more prepared spiritually. I certainly never stayed in that room again. Staying at the Chicago Congress Plaza Hotel and Convention Center doesn't sound like a great idea based on some of the reviews we've seen on TripAdvisor. Here's the first. We walked into the lobby of this hotel and thought how beautiful it looked. We were very excited. However, the very few people working the desk and check-in took a long time. Finally, after getting our key, we went up to our room. Since the lobby looked fantastic, we thought our room would be too. However, as we unlocked the door to our room, we were very disappointed. 
The room was very dimly lit with one light bulb in the middle of a very high ceiling. The wallpaper was coming off the walls and the curtains were falling off their rods. The carpet in the room looked filthy and we were afraid to walk around on our bare feet. The bathroom looked like it was updated, but the tiles on the floor were cracked. They tried to glue the pieces back together but had an abundance of glue that was hard and dry over their repair work. The closet, where we kept our suitcases, has paint chips all over the floor. My wife dropped her brush behind a dresser. When I went to go move the dresser, you can tell it hadn't been moved in a while. We found what appeared to be some form of medicine capsules, snack bags, and written notes from somebody's business trip. They offered no free Wi-Fi and you had to pay extra for internet. The restaurants in the hotel were way overpriced even for a simple breakfast. We opted to eat other places. Obviously not a glowing recommendation for this Chicago hotel. On the other hand, perhaps it does have one or two redeeming qualities. Hauntings Upon our return home, I did some further research on this hotel. I found out that it's one of the top 10 haunted hotels in America. Before knowing of this, however, the first night, while in the shower, my wife and daughter heard a strange sound from under the bed. I checked, saw nothing, and laughed it off. The last night of our stay there, we were in bed and it was very quiet. All of a sudden, we heard a knocking sound on our headboard of our bed. To this day, we cannot explain what happened. I had the feeling the whole time we were there, someone would pop out of the walls. It was that eerie. The one elevator had a 13th floor and the other elevator was numbered 22, 33, 44, 66. Made no sense. After getting home and reading about the hotel, there were other strange events as well. I am glad we didn't know about them ahead of time. So says John K., a reviewer on TripAdvisor.com. Jess B. and her husband went there just to sample the hauntings and room 441 in particular. We chose to stay here because we read up on haunted hotels and wanted something haunted and scary for our anniversary. Well, it's definitely old, creepy, outdated, smells, not really sure if it's really haunted or not, and we did stay in room 441. I swear I felt the bed get kicked twice the first night, but my husband assured me it was in my head since he didn't feel it. Anyway, that was all. No ghosts or shadows, lol. The last night, someone kept knocking on the door and trying to open our door, but I'm sure that was just kids. Also went to the 12th floor north, and nothing haunted there either but a really old hallway. Our room, 441, was huge and creepy. The curtains are quite scary, lol. Yet another reviewer had this to say. I stayed there on company trips, so didn't actually pick this hotel. All I know is it was definitely haunted. I was laying on my bed and the curtain moved to the side as if somebody was peeking at me. Then my friend said she heard someone whistling in our room when she was in the bathroom. She looked out and nobody was in there. It happened three times. I had no idea this hotel was even haunted until I told my friend about it and he looked the hotel up for me. He sent me the link about it. This hotel is one of the most haunted hotels in Chicago. I wish I'd known this before I stayed there. The hallways look like the hallways from that movie The Shining. And then there's Dan DeBron, a journalist who stayed there and did his own investigation of the place after his friend told him he saw a shadow-like figure standing by his bed when he woke up in the middle of the night. He says he woke up and saw the figure for a second or two before it dissolved away. This is what he had to say at WJON.com. I've always loved a good ghost story, but have always been a skeptic on paranormal topics. However, if there's a time that nearly changed my mind, it was my recent stay in Chicago's Congress Plaza Hotel. I spent a weekend in the hotel with two friends to attend the local St. Patrick's Day festivities. 
We booked a room because it was affordable and within walking distance of everything we wanted to see in the downtown area. None of us went in with any idea it was a notoriously haunted location. The hotel was built in 1893 and has an old-fashioned, creepy look with classic carpets, wallpaper, and dim lighting. The hallways made me feel like I entered The Shining. I half expected to see twin girls staring at me whenever I turned a corner in this place. My experience with the haunted part of the hotel started after our first night. In the morning, my friend told me that he swore he saw a shadow-like figure standing by his bed when he woke up in the middle of the night. He says he woke up and saw the figure for a second or two before it dissolved away. That's when we both got curious and decided to search the history of the hotel in our phones for any history of ghost stories. Sure enough, some websites and blogs dubbed the Congress Plaza Hotel the most haunted hotel in Chicago. We found dozens of ghost stories that gave me chills. One story was about a former captain in the Spanish-American Civil War who apparently shot himself in the hotel. His shadow now haunts the building and scares hotel staff and guests. Maybe this is what my friend saw. There was a mention of other notorious ghosts in the building. One named Peg Leg Johnny apparently plays pranks on guests on the fourth floor there are even ghostly children who apparently haunt the twelfth floors because their mother went crazy and threw them off the roof of the building in the early 1900s. We even found a story about a room so horrible in the hotel, staff wouldn't go near it and had to close it away. We decided to explore the rumors and interesting locations we found online later that night. Strangely enough, some of the stories we investigated may have some truth to them. The first thing we checked out was the 12th floor. Apparently, there was a room so haunted and awful on the 12th floor that staff had to seal it away from being used. I almost didn't believe it, but our trip to the 12th floor revealed a sealed-off door with no handle. I knocked on the area, and it seemed hollow like there was a room on the other side. I also started feeling a little off on the 12th floor. It's a ghost story cliché but it felt like I was being watched. It honestly gave me the feeling of wanting to leave the area as soon as I could. I'd read stories of people having to leave the Congress in the middle of the night because they felt paranoid and couldn't sleep. I had the same feeling inside the staircases. I felt paranoid and swore I was hearing voices when I went from floor to floor. I look back and credit this to me psyching myself up at the time. Still, certain areas of the hotel made me more uneasy than others. During our improv Ghostbusters tour, we also saw several rooms sealed away with padlocks. One door, which appeared to lead to another section of the hotel, was locked with an intimidating chain. We also walked past room 441. Blogs claimed it was the most complained-about room in the hotel, because a ghostly woman shakes the bed inside the room in the middle of the night. At the end of the night, I saw no ghosts and remain a skeptic. I feel like everything I saw or heard could be credited to hotel maintenance or my own mind playing tricks on me. However, I can't let go of the fact that certain areas in the building did make me feel uneasy, particularly the 12th floor and staircases. I regret not taking a picture of those areas. Was it ghostly activity or just my mind playing tricks on me? I tend to pick the latter. What do you think? So next time you're visiting the Windy City, this could be the hotel for you. We moved into a new house when I was 14. I always felt uneasy being upstairs or in my bedroom and had this constant feeling of being watched. Some small things had happened, but the most notorious was that my wardrobe door would randomly open in the middle of the night. It always happened when I was still awake. I would spend hours reading until late at night before falling asleep. These wardrobes had proper door handles that latched, 
you would need to lift the handle straight up to get it open. Alternatively, if you were hiding inside the wardrobe, you could open it by squeezing the latch from the inside until it popped open. The first few times this happened, I simply thought that the door must have not been shut properly. Naturally, I started to pay close attention to see if the door latched. You could hear a clicking sound when it did, and I also pulled the door handle straight back without lifting it to confirm that it was indeed latched and the door wouldn't open on its own. This still happened a couple of times, but only at night, and those nights I was terrified and slept with my lights on. That happened dozens of times, but only one incident stands out as weirder. It was late at night and I was already sleeping when the sound of a phone ringing woke me up. At first, I couldn't determine where the sound came from and I really freaked out because my room was directly above my mother's room and living in an old house, I always tried to be as quiet as possible. I sprinted up from bed and located the sound as coming from one of my drawers full of old stuff that I didn't really use. I always used to collect old stuff, never cleaning anything out. I started digging in one of the drawers and finally found the cause of my panic. It was one of my old phones. It wasn't ringing, it had an alarm that was going off. This was a phone I hadn't used in a good few years, so I was really confused at this point. It was an old Samsung. At the time, I just turned the alarm off and went back to bed, even though I had problems falling back to sleep after that. The next day, I got up and checked the phone again and I realized that it didn't even have a battery in it. I heard that some electrical things can sort of save up energy for a long time, but why would it suddenly start an alarm? It's not something I would have ever made a setting for either whilst I was still using it. Who sets an alarm to ring in the middle of the night? One night, when I was about 13 or 14, I was lying in bed in that half-asleep state before you really doze off. I was staring at my wall that faced the front of the house and it was very dark. Suddenly, I saw a figure walk through my wall towards me. I could tell by his shape that he was a man, but I saw no other distinguishable features other than it seemed as if he was wearing a long cloak and a flat-rimmed hat. I was kind of frozen as I watched him move closer. He came right next to me, bent down and kissed the top of my head, and it felt like ice had touched me. That snapped me out of my stupor and I sat up. The man was gone, but the top of my head was cold to the touch. What makes this even creepier is that I found out that my mom and her sister had an encounter with the same entity. They both saw this hat man standing at their bedroom door, which was usually shut and locked. And if you Google search the hat man, you will find many other encounters of this. Most believe he is evil, but my encounter was far from evil. But it still shakes me to this day. Until receiving that last story, I didn't know anything about the hat man. Fortunately, Tim Brown makes it his business to know about him. He owns the site thehatmanproject.com. Here he tells why he began investigating the phenomenon. My experience with the hat man came in 1994 when I was about 14 years old. I was living with my grandmother and great-grandmother at the time at my home in Nashville, Tennessee. I'd been staying up really late that night, and at about 2 a.m. in the morning, I found myself lying in bed and nodding off as I was watching TV. The lights were all off, and the only light that was lighting my room was coming from the TV set in front of me. From where I was lying, my bed was positioned up against the wall. Looking down toward my feet, I had a clear view all the way into and through my great-grandmother's room, which was just parallel to mine, as there was no door between my room and hers. 
I could also see into the hallway. Just inside the hallway was the doorway going into my grandmother's room. As I was lying there with the covers pulled up to my face nodding off, my eyes would open and fall, open and fall, over and over again, except that I heard something on TV that made me open my eyes a little wider. Only this time, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. I always had a fear about intruders and what I would do if someone ever broke into our home. For a brief moment, I thought that the movement I was seeing might be my grandmother getting up to go to the bathroom. But as I moved my eyes more into focus, looking down through my great-grandmother's room into the hallway, I very quickly realized that it wasn't my grandmother. What I saw gripped me immediately with fear and dread. I saw a tall, human-like figure, and the figure looked like that of a man. The man had no distinguishable features whatsoever. I could see no eyes, no nose or mouth, only blackness. He looked like a shadow, only darker, much darker. He had a very wide-brimmed hat and a long trench coat that flowed as he moved. I started to tremble. My heart began to race. At that moment, I came to the conviction that there was indeed an intruder in my house. As I watched him move in the back of my mind, I began to play out scenarios as to what he and I were going to do. Was I going to yell? Was I going to get up and run after him and try to fight him? I kept looking into the hallway. He stood there at the threshold between my great-grandmother's room and my grandmother's room. He leaned his head and body into my great-grandmother's room and looked in, turning his head toward her and then toward me. I had my eyes closed as much as I could so I could still see him and yet still look like I was sleeping. He stood there for what seemed like an eternity. He then moved very slowly and without sound back into the hallway just out of view. Then immediately I saw his figure move toward my grandmother's room, the same as before. He leaned his body and head in, looking at her, again not making a sound. He then leaned back and moved out of view into the hallway. At this point, I didn't know what else to do. I was convinced that we had some kind of burglar in the house, so I summed up as much courage as I could, jumped out of the bed yelling and charging into the hallway ready for a fight. I turned the hallway and… he was gone. Obviously, I had startled and woke up my grandmother and great-grandmother. I told them what had happened and needless to say we didn't go back to sleep for a long time. And when we did, we left the light on. After my experience that night and during the next day, I spent a lot of time talking with my family about what had happened. I was surprised to know that my experience of the man with the hat and cape was not the only one that had happened in that house. As it turned out, both my grandmother and great-grandmother had seen the same thing, although they had described him in different terms. Over the years, since that time, I'd grown very antagonistic against the whole thing, brushing it off as mere happenstance, a figment of my imagination, or perhaps the result of my nodding off and being in that in-between place of being half awake and half asleep. I thought about it every now and then, but relegated it to the back part of my mind and paid little attention to it. I would continue to feel this way about the experience until two years ago. That's when everything changed. I was listening to Coast to Coast AM with George Norrie one evening, and it was really late in the night, perhaps 2 or 3 AM. They were doing a show on what was called shadow beings. It was the first time that I had ever heard of something like that. As I listened to the show, nothing could prepare me for what I heard next. George Norrie and the guest went on to describe people's experiences with one particular shadow being, a dark man-like figure with a large, wide-brimmed hat and a cape. Immediately, I felt chills run down my spine. I knew at that moment that what had happened to me as a teenager was not a figment of my imagination and was definitely not the result of me nodding off. I had seen what these people were describing. Since that time, I have engaged in quite a bit of research on the phenomenon of the hat man. 
I've read countless stories from others who have had similar experiences and have compared people's stories to try to make sense out of what's happening. I now believe that I'm in a place in life where I can draw some conclusions on who or what the Hat Man is and how he's connected to the wider experience of the shadow people. This website serves as a staging ground to continue my research and to offer my help to those who've experienced the same phenomenon. You can visit his website at thehatmanproject.com. I've lived in my current house for several years. I spend much of the day out as I work, but these events have been taking place in the evening. I haven't been able to shed any light on them, but wanted to share them with you to see if anyone had any feedback. I came home from work a few months ago, and after dinner, I fell asleep. When I woke up, it was about 11 in the evening. I began walking to my room, which was located at the end of the hall, and as I walked, I felt a stinging sensation on my left arm. I thought something must have scratched me, but when I checked the scratch after entering my room, I couldn't find any explanation for what had scratched me. I just saw three light scratch marks. A few weeks later, I started feeling like there was always something waiting for me whenever I would enter my home. The air started feeling heavy and I would see shadows. Over the next few months, more of these scratches started appearing on me. I wouldn't feel it, but when I would shower, I would notice these scratch marks on different parts of my body. Then about a month ago, I kept hearing this really loud banging noise coming from the hall. Whenever I tried to ignore it, it would just seem to get closer and louder. The noise usually started around 5 in the evening and ended as late as 5 in the morning. Two days ago, I was sitting on my computer checking my email and I hear a gravelly voice behind me growl. Last weekend, I had some friends staying over and we were in the kitchen cooking and we heard knocking on the walls of the room. I have no idea what is going on in this house. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. This story is part historical and part first-hand experience. Elizabeth Betsy Reed was a woman of mystery. She had lived more than 160 years ago, but I could not get her out of my mind. It sounds crazy, but she held a strange appeal to me. I've always loved history, and this was that, plus there's a supernatural twist to this story. Elizabeth Reed lived a hard, difficult life in what we now call Midwest flyover country. Much of her early life is unknown, including the exact date of her birth. Her father supposedly taught her the skills of a healer. She knew all about herbs and how to make medicines. Her father died and she was abused by her mother. Betsy left home and was on her own by the time she was around 14 years old. She drifted around Illinois and Indiana during this time. It was several years later she met Leonard Reed and the couple were soon married. Living in an area called Purgatory Swamp near Heathsville, Illinois, located in Crawford County. 
Her secretive nature and the herbal remedies she made caused people to suspect her of being a witch. She was also, according to sources, a hardened woman, but still quite attractive. She had one other thing that made people speak in hushed tongues about her past. She had a long J-shaped scar from her chin to her high cheekbone on the other side of her face. Back in those times, it was thought of as being a marked or scarlet woman. She would always wear a large bonnet to help hide this when she was out in public. She and Leonard went about running a small farm. Then, on August 15, 1844, Leonard, who had taken ill a few days earlier, passed away. It wasn't long afterward that the talk began. Evelyn Deal, Leonard's niece, began to tell others that she saw Betsy put an unknown white powder in Leonard's sassafras tea on at least one occasion. Betsy was questioned and then arrested. She was taken to the jail in Palestine, Illinois, the small village about 11 miles away. While there, Betsy never failed to raise even more suspicion about her being a witch. Apparently, she burned the jail down, but she possessed no means to start fire. A mob soon formed and she was almost hung at that time, but the law intervened and she was moved to Lawrenceville, Illinois, some 25 miles south. She was put on trial in May 1845 at the courthouse in Lawrenceville, Illinois. Betsy's defense team was Augustus French and Usher Linder, both well-known attorneys. It was Evelyn Deal's testimony and the stigma of Betsy's character that sealed her fate. Her trial lasted but three days. She did not speak in her defense and was found guilty. Judge William Wilson of the Illinois Supreme Court sentenced her to hang. The small town of Lawrenceville swelled its population on the day of the execution. There were crowds of 8,000 to 10,000 people waiting to see a woman hang. Betsy was said to have found God and was, according to witnesses, sitting on her coffin singing hymns and quoting Bible verses. The minister who presided, Rev. John Seed, preached a long sermon before Betsy was taken to the gallows and hung. She was the first woman publicly executed and the only woman executed by hanging in Illinois. It doesn't end here, though. According to accounts of the time, Betsy's body was taken by several doctors and an autopsy was done. They found small rocks and glass in her stomach. Apparently, she was trying to commit suicide to cheat a public hanging. Then, Lawrenceville would not let her be buried in the city cemetery. She was buried outside the grounds of the cemetery. Her brother came a few days later and dug her up in the middle of the night and took her back to Crawford County and buried her next to Leonard in Baker Cemetery near Heathsville, Illinois. She is still there today, in more than one way. Now for the other part of the story. Here is my account of visiting her grave for the first time. I was finally going to visit the final resting place of the infamous Elizabeth Betsy Reed. We were driving north on Route 1 just about two miles away from Flat Rock, Illinois. I was getting excited. I knew we were still several miles away, but we were at least halfway there now. Passing the main road into the center of Flat Rock, we turned at the next paved road on our right. This well-worn blacktop would take us past the edge of town towards Heathsville, Illinois. Not much on this stretch of road, but fields and a few houses. We sped along in the lazy heat of a summer's afternoon sun. It can't be much further, I mumbled to my friend. He responded, no, it's probably about three or four miles to Route 33, which runs to either Palestine, Illinois, or Vincennes, Indiana. Just depends on which way you turn. But we wouldn't be turning at all. Just crossing 33 and going down another well-worn, narrow blacktop. Approaching the stop sign, we came to a rest, and then we proceeded across the road, passing a house on our left and turned left heading down the narrow road. A few bumps here and there. I was thinking to myself, picturing a wagon with a crude wooden coffin containing the body of Elizabeth Reed being driven down this same road. 
except it was a dirt lane with tall prairie grass growing waist-high along the beaten dirt path. I could almost hear the wagon squeaking and creaking, the horses sighing and breathing deep, snorting air through their large nostrils and exhaling. Suddenly we stopped with a jerk, snapping me out of my dreamlike state. What the hell? I exclaimed. My friend was like, where now? Oh, uh, take a left on the gravel road. There should be a creek near the cemetery sign. Should be on our left. We drove slowly on the loose gravel, passing a house next to a cornfield. I could see it. The sign was ahead. Hey, man, there it is, I shouted. My friend was laughing as he said, I've never seen someone get so excited to visit a cemetery. I snapped a pic of the weather-beaten steel cemetery sign in block print, all in capitals. It said, Baker Cemetery. The dirt lane winded up and to the right, winding back to the left at the top of the hill. Trees encircled the cemetery, giving it a touch of eeriness. There was another sign with just Baker spelled out and a 55-gallon trash barrel to the side. We parked in the shade of the old growth trees. I was just spellbound. This was the perfect cemetery for Betsy to be buried at. The woods that she loved so much surrounded her. It was so serene there. Old and worn tombstones faced us. Some were well-worn, some broken in half. I knew she was in one of the back corners. We walked a bit, taking it all in. It was so peaceful, with just the light breeze going through the leaves of the tall trees. The sun was shining, and it caused the tombstones to almost glow. As we walked to the northeast of the cemetery, where it was heavily shaded and one felt like civilization was a thousand miles away, the cemetery was on quite a large hill from this perspective. We continued walking down the last row, getting closer to the end. It has to be here. Then it was. Surprisingly, a much newer tombstone awaited us. It was a polished flat stone, probably only 30 years old or so. It had the most interesting inscription. Elizabeth Betsy Reed died May 23, 1845, death by hanging. Leonard Reed died August 9, 1844, death by murder. Then a few moments passed, and I smelled a sweet bouquet, a very strong aroma as I stood over the grave. I turned to my friend saying, Do you smell that? Yeah, I do now that you mentioned it. I looked at him. It's her. He laughed a bit. I said, I'm serious, man. Spirits, especially female ones, when present, you'll smell a sweet flower-like aroma. If that wasn't enough, I took a few steps past Betsy's tombstone and saw none other than a sassafras tree. I had to chuckle a bit nervously. Hey, I told my friend look at this, a sassafras tree. You know that she supposedly killed her husband by poisoning his sassafras tea, I exclaimed. My friend just stared at me blankly. Then, just as we started walking away, I smelled that sweet smell again. Turning back to look at her grave, I saw a brightness illuminate it. As we walked getting closer to the shaded entrance, the scent disappeared. The sky was turning gray and the clouds were rolling in. It had been a sunny day with a gentle wind just a few minutes ago. A storm was moving in as we got into the car and drove down the narrow, bumpy dirt lane. I knew I would come back again. My fascination with Betsy would be with me for a very long time. The bones of an estimated 6 million people are in the catacombs under Paris, France. They were transported there towards the end of the 18th century from overflowing medieval cemeteries. While illegal to venture into these tunnels, it didn't stop two teenage boys from doing so, and they became lost for three days. The two teenagers went into the catacombs last Saturday night, June 10, 2017, 
It's not clear when or how the alarm was raised, but police launched their rescue efforts three days later. The spokesman for the Paris Fire Service said tracker dogs had helped them find the boys, ages 16 and 17, during a four-hour rescue effort. The catacombs are a network of burial chambers that stretch some 250 kilometers, or 150 miles, beneath the French capital. Only a small section of the catacombs is open to the public, but enthusiasts, known in French as cataphiles, have been known to sneak illegally into the tunnels via secret entrances, to explore them or hold secret parties. The two boys were said to be suffering from hypothermia but otherwise unharmed. The temperature in the dark, narrow passageways is about 15 degrees Celsius, 59 degrees Fahrenheit. Add to that the fact that they just spent three days trapped underground with millions of corpses, and I'm sure it's an experience they will never soon forget or wish to repeat. These strange mummies were found in the Italian city of Venzone, a small hamlet in the province of Udine. The first mummy was unearthed in 1647, and soon thereafter scores of similar ancient bodies were discovered buried beneath the town's cathedral. Scientists were able to recover as many as 42 mummies, then after an earthquake struck the region in 1976, the number of mummies reduced to only 15. What made the Venzone mummies unusual and quite puzzling was that the bodies had never decomposed. Scientists started to investigate the ancient corpses to determine what prevented the mummies from decomposing. The mummies were all alike in appearance and showed the same peculiarities when dissected. The bodies preserved their forms and the features. Although they were greatly altered, they were still recognizable. The corpses were extremely light, and researchers noticed the skin, which was of a yellowish-brown tint, looked like tanned leather. The weight of the mummies varied from 22 to 44 pounds for the tallest individuals. It soon became clear that these people were mummified by natural processes, but the cause of the Venzone mummy's preservation remains a mystery. In the Literary Digest translated portions of an article by F. Savorgnin de Braza in which he stated that the preservation of dead bodies may be brought about artificially by the use of chemicals, as is the case with the mummies of Egypt, Peru, and Mexico. The mummification is sometimes also natural. Certain tombs and certain cemeteries have the property of preserving and mummifying bodies, and though these are not very numerous, they are not as rare as one might think. In all such cases, bodies are found to be dried and mummified naturally, so that after removal from their tombs they resist the destructive action of the atmosphere indefinitely. There have been many hypotheses regarding this preservation of bodies in the tombs of Enzone. Some have attributed it to the presence of salts of nitre, alumina, or lime, but there are no such salts in the tombs. New investigations have proved that the mummification is not due to chemical action, but to a biological process. Modern scientists have been able to place the blame of this mummification on Haifa tumbacina, the microscopic parasite fungus likely does it by rapidly dehydrating the bodies before they can begin to decompose. The Haifa tumbacina was discovered in several parts of the bodies and it also covered the wooden coffins. The fungus grows in the cathedral graves it manages to dehydrate a body in one year and make the skin pergamidious. However, there is still some doubt that the Haifa parasite is the true cause. Some scientists assert the limestone present in the surrounding earth may be the culprit. The practice of burying dead in churches was later banned, which prevented further observation of the natural process. 
While a number of theories have been offered as to the cause of the mummy's preservation, there is still no conclusive opinion as what exactly did stop the decomposition process and the mummies of Venzone remain an ancient, unsolved mystery. In the summer of 1999, a group of us went on an overnight rafting trip down the Guadalupe River in the Big Bend area of Texas. We started out in the morning and made camp on a sandbar before sunset. At this point, I estimate that we were probably around 50 to 100 miles from any town. The river guides prepared dinner. We ate, and then a girl and I retreated to the river with our chairs. By this time, it was pitch black. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. We sat talking and I faced my chair upstream and she was faced downstream. As we talked, I noticed a light, very faint, traveling toward us from upstream. It got closer and closer and I could see that it was on the opposite side of the river. When it was directly across from us, I could see that it was about the size of a tennis ball peel, yellow-green, and about 25 feet in the air. There were tall trees on the opposite side of the river, and we could see the light as it passed behind some trees and in front of others. It kept going downstream and eventually got to a bend in the river where a pile of dead branches had washed up on shore. When it got to the branches, we could hear a crunching sound like something heavy was walking there. It passed the branches and went down the river a few hundred feet, stopped, then started back towards us. It crunched on the branches on the way back, then kept going the way it had come until it was out of sight. On the way out the next morning, I checked the opposite bank as we rafted past, but could not see any footprints. We never did figure out what it was. Have you seen something strange in the woods? Send it to me at WeirdDarkness.com. You're listening to a Weird Darkness Darkives episode, where I reach back to share an episode with you from years past. If my voice sounds different in this episode, it's because the recordings are older, my presentation style was different, and my voice has naturally gotten lower over the years. For some of you, this will be a nice blast from the past. For others, it'll be new to you with stories you've not yet heard me tell. My goal now is to bring you new episodes of Weird Darkness every Monday through Friday as best I can, and also post a Dark Archives episode, or Darkives episode, every day of the week as well. I hope you enjoy the new schedule. In late 2006, I finished my time in the U.S. Army. I was young and wanted to enjoy my newly found outlook on life outside the military. This new outlook was indicative of me enjoying some family time. This was family time that I had not had in years, so I moved back to Massachusetts to be closer to them. My mother suggested that I move in with her until I had a stable job and reserved income to stay ahead. I was opposed to it at first until she told me that the third floor was done over and would be perfect. In October of 2006, I moved in. My brother and sister also lived on the third floor, but that was not a bother for me. I had been in the house only one other time before that. It was when my mom was moving in. I always felt weird in there, but never thought anything of it. Now I am full-on living in this house and everything feels slightly off. The first incident was in early November. I was shaving my face. I do not know what happened, but I lost about an hour of time. It was long enough, 
for the shaving cream to start to break down. I did not realize how long I had been in the bathroom performing this activity until I had got out. My brother scowled at me and said, an hour? I thought you guys in the army were supposed to be quick. I laughed at first, until I looked at the clock to see that it had been almost an hour. I thought it to be strange, but did not think too hard on it. I was a very skeptical person at this point in my life. My second incident began about three nights later. It was about 10.30 p.m. I was in the bathroom and I could hear what sounded like footsteps. I peered under the door the best I could to see who it was. All I could see what appeared to me to be as two shadows of what I had to assume were legs. I blasted the door open quickly. I had to open it quickly because no one was supposed to be home for about three more hours. I was now officially worried that someone was intruding in my mom's house. I was still skeptical enough to assume it was a person. Whom else would it be? I was quick enough to grab my bat and I began systematically clearing every room. No one was to be found and all the doors were still locked. I chalked it up to nerves and the house being old. Most of all, I felt that I was just genuinely being paranoid. I was still trying to get my bearings on being a civilian, so I was a tad bit weary all the time. The next day, I'm on the second floor. That is where the main kitchen, dining room, living room, main bathroom, and main bedroom was. My mom is gathering my brother and sister's clothes up. She's walking up the stairs, and my brother and I hear a huge slam. She comes down the stairs yelling. As she comes into the dining room, my brother is looking right at her and she drops her basket. Carl goes, why were you swearing about me for? My mom tells us that when she got upstairs right to Carl's door, the door slammed hard in her face. I, being the only rational one, asked if the window was open. My mom said she did not know, so I went up to investigate. With my brother in tow, we ascended the staircase. My brother's room was at the top of the steps. I opened the door expecting to see an open window, but it was shut tight and locked. Being that it was November now in Massachusetts, of course it would be shut. I was still the one saying it could have been just a draft and that we should just let it go instead of speculating. So every day leading up to our first major event was plagued by shadows, knocks, and footsteps. I still try to brush it off as just mere coincidence and an old house. It's now the second week of December. It's about 3 a.m. I wake to hear my brother shouting no and that he cannot and will not stay here anymore. I run in to see if everything is okay and he tells me emphatically no, nothing is okay. I walk him outside, helping him with his bags. He just grabbed the things he could see and nothing more. We're outside the house and I ask him again what happened. He looks at me and says that I wouldn't believe him. I told him to try me. He agrees and begins to tell me what happened. He details hearing a rustling sound that woke him. He thought it was our dog Simba, so he tells me that he rolled over to tell her to get out. He said that when he rolled over, he saw what looked like a naked person run real fast through the wall. He said that startled him, but what came next? is what scared him out of the house. He said it looked like the person who ran was being chased by something. He described it as being grotesque, gruesome, and he said it was crab walking through the same area of the wall. He said it was like something out of a horror movie. I asked him if it was possibly sleep paralysis. He said it couldn't be because he shot up out of bed when he saw the person, and he got the full effect of the monster that was behind him. My brother never stepped back into the house after that night. He said to me that he could never go back in and that the house scared him. The week passes and we spend Christmas at my aunt's house because of this incident. A couple days after Christmas, my mom and I are watching TV. We're watching a show. It's about 11.30 or so a.m. Something draws my attention. I look at the doorway to see what looks to me like a person wearing a giant hat and cloak. This person, at the time, blocks out the sun and takes up most of the doorway with its height and stature. 
I look away for a moment, and it's gone. My mom reacts immediately to ask me if I saw that as well. I said I did, and I grabbed her pistol and asked her to lock her doors while I searched the house. I run through every floor and every door. All the doors to get in and out of the house are still locked and deadbolted. I come up with nothing and no solution or answer to what I, we, just saw. I come back and ask my mom to draw what she saw, and so do I. We compare the drawings. They're almost identical. I am now officially scared. My mom and I go to the dining room and start asking each other a question or two about it, like, for instance, its eyes or any distinguishable features. We write it all down. We compare the answers, and all our answers match. I'm scared but also have to be tough or get bullied by whatever it is. For the days leading up to my final encounter, the house felt like it wanted me out. The house now to me felt like it was alive in a sense. With the constant footsteps, shadows, and knocking almost all hours of the day, it was enough to drive me mad. One night, I'm laying down to go to bed. My bedroom was right outside a street light. This light had lit my room pretty well for the most part. I'm laying on my side, facing my window. As I lay there, I begin to hear what sounds like faint whispers. While the whispers are going on, I start to see the light from the street light start to retreat out of my room. As I get closer to the window, the whispers got louder. When the light finally made it to my windowsill, I heard, let's get him, right in my ear. I sat up and yelled at whatever to get out of my room. When I said that, I heard a loud crash from within my room. I jumped fully out of my bed and turned on the lights. I look around to find a softball-sized hole in my wall, about six or seven inches above where my cable box was. I went into work the next morning and put in my two weeks' notice. I've only been inside that house one other time since that incident. That was about three months after it because my mom had sold it on a short sale and she was moving out. I've driven by the house on occasion, visiting my mom. Just trying to look at it gives me anxiety. Good luck to anyone who tries to investigate it. I do not know who owns it. The house has changed hands two times since my mom. Also as a bonus, when I left my mom got new carpets put in all the rooms. She told me years later that when they pulled my carpet up, they found a door. It had hundreds of nails in it. She said it looked ominous. The house in the story is real, and the events are accurate. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness.